Hello there. So I guess quite a few people in this room started this day pretty much as I did, right? Taking a long walk with your dogs. How many dog owners are there actually in the room? I would have thought so. So, you know, uh, probably a majority in the room. And those of you who are not dog owners, you probably used to be or want to be. Because the dog is by far not only the oldest domestic animal, it's also the most world, worldwide spread species that share our lives. So I don't have to persuade you that the dog is man's best friend. We all know that. What I want to try to persuade you about today is it's also the scientist's best friend. So to do that, we basically need some, some, some structure to this. Why, why is it? Why are dogs uh, this common uh, domesticated animal? Why was it the first domesticated animal? Well, the answer is actually right here in this picture. So all dogs on this planet stem from the wolf. And it all started about 15,000 years ago. And the reason that the dog was the first species to start sharing our lives is caught on this picture. Because these wolves are demonstrating something which they share with us humans. And that is an extreme ability to cooperate. So what these dogs are doing right now is totally impossible for a single dog. Uh, the, uh, what the wolves are doing is totally impossible for a single wolf to do. A wolf cannot kill a bison. But together they can. And to do that, they need to take roles. They need to um, uh, adapt their behavior to what the rest of the animals in the pack are doing. And this is what we have taxed in on. We have taken the wolf, we've domesticated it, and we have tweaked their behavior. So today, they direct this ability to communicate, interact, and so on towards us humans. Um, so this is one interesting aspect of the dog. Uh, another thing that, that, that we are really um, interested in as scientists is the fact that during these 15,000 years, we have changed the dogs in a number of different ways to the extent that there is no other species on this planet today that is more variable than the dog. So we have dog breeds, genetically stable dog breeds, that reach an adult weight of 700 grams, and we have some breeds that reach an adult weight of 70 kilos. And they are able to reproduce. I admit there may be technical problems in that uh, particular case, but genetically they are totally compatible and will produce fertile offspring. Now, my topic is behavior. I'm an animal behavior scientist, so of course this is really interesting to have all this variation in appearance. What is more interesting is that the same wide variation actually uh, uh, is present also in their behavior. So we have some dog breeds that uh, instinctively from birth onwards think that a group of disorganized birds should be herded. Whereas other dog breeds instinctively think that the same type of bird should be carried around in the mouth. And no one has to teach them that. This is all based on their genetic predispositions. So this is an amazing source for a person like me who is really interested in the genetics underlying animal behavior. So what kind of traits could we actually use and study in the dogs? Well, we, uh, I already mentioned that we tweak the wolf's social abilities into being directed against us humans. And dogs do some quite uh, amazing things when it comes to communication with humans. Dogs are fantastic in responding to human ostensive cues of different kinds, for example, pointing. I mean, that's so self-evident to, to every dog owner. You don't even think about it that the dog will actually follow your pointing gestures or your gaze. But in fact, you should think about it because this is something where they totally outperform even a chimpanzee and definitely their ancestors, the wolves. They are capable of understanding the difference between their own minds and the minds of us. That's what psychologists used to refer to as theory of mind. So this dog perfectly well understands that the person who is reading a book or fiddling with their mobile phone uh, is not paying attention. 
you can use that information, for example, for stealing a cookie from the table when, when, when the owner is busy with, uh, with something else. But that's a, uh, actually a remarkable ability. They are capable of empathy. They can distinguish different facial expressions. They can easily tell the difference between a happy and a sad human facial expression. They will respond to emotional expression in humans with, with uh, empathic and compassionate behavior. They will even understand a lot of our spoken language. One very skilled dog that was investigated for a five years period, a border collie named Chaser, was able to attribute unique words to more than 1,000 different objects. It classified the objects in different categories, and it was able to form two-word sentences, distinguishing verbs from nouns. So this is all amazing. What do they use it for? Well, mainly to cooperate with humans. So they use, they use the abilities to uh, interact with us and to, in different ways, um, cooperate. So this is something that we are um, really interested in learning more about. So we want to understand the genetic underpinnings of this. So what we essentially want to do is to understand which genes, which stretches of DNA, which DNA sequences have been selected during domestication to cause this variation between breeds and also within breeds in the ability to interact and cooperate with humans. So how can we do this? Well, we need, a, first of all, we need some kind of a map to help us orient ourselves in the genome. And luckily enough, the dog was one of the first species that had its entire genome fully sequenced. And this was published already in 2005. So since then, since then we have a, um, a really good map of the position of every single one of the billions of bases in the DNA of the dog. <clears throat> and the picture here is uh, on Tasha the boxer that actually had her DNA sequenced and is the reference genome, as we call it, for dogs. So that's really good. We can dive into this genome and we can use this map to uh, actually look at the connection between genetic variations and different types of behavior. The second thing we need is some kind of good behavior to measure so we can get a quantitative assessment of what the dogs are actually doing in respect to their relations to humans. So what we do here is that we take advantage of a, a very particular skill that dogs have and that we don't see in any other species as far as I'm aware. And this skill, dogs can actually use this skill to solve problems, even unsolvable problems. So this may sound like um, um, an Im impossible task. I mean, literally, it is impossible, but dogs can solve it. I'll show you in a second. This is the kind of task that we are using in some of our experiments. So the dog is simply presented with um, uh, these uh, three uh, little uh, containers. They have uh, transparent lids on top of them, and these lids can easily be slid to the side, and underneath that lid there is a little treat for the dog. So you don't have to give the dog a lot of teaching and experience. They will figure this out pretty fast. The two lids at the edges of this device can be easily slid to the side. The one in the middle can't because we tightened it with a screw. So it literally cannot be moved. So just when the dog has realized that this was a simple task, I'm going to get a lot of treats, they run into this problem, which is literally unsolvable. But dogs can solve it. So this is um, one of our experimental dogs that are showing you how they solve this. So they first work a little bit on uh, the, the parts that are easy. So flip this, the, the, these lids to the side. And then we have the one in the middle. But in a second, this dog will show you how it can solve that as well. And this is how it does it. There we go. It's a very simple way of solving this issue. You turn to a human and you say, hey, there's something wrong here. Come here and help me. No other species that have been tested in, in situations like this ever do this. Chimps don't do it. Wolves don't do it. Dogs do it all the time. And there is a huge variation in how they do it. This is a pug. His name is Busse, by the way. 
He was part of one of our experiments and he's doing exactly the same thing and he's quickly realizing that this was a really ridiculous task. I mean, how difficult is it actually? You just slid this thing to the side and after a while it kind of encounters this impossible problem. And you're a small pug, the world is big. How on earth are you going to solve this? Well, you get help. And if they don't understand, you have to be convincing. So this is a really kind of convincing um, uh, behavior from a small pug, but the variation is huge. Some dogs are more like behave more like wolves in this situation. They have wolves in this situation. They have kind of hybrids. They really are sure that if I just work for long enough, finally I will solve this problem, and they just go on and go on. Some dogs tend to do the same, but most dogs tend to turn to humans more or less uh, actively. So I had a PhD student, and she spent months. Um, recording the behavior of a group of laboratory beagles in this particular situation. And the good thing about this population is, of course, we have the total pedigree. We know all about their ancestry, generations back. So we can calculate some genetic um, information based on this. And what we found in this experiment here is that about 25% of the variation that you see in this behavior, this tendency to seek human help, can be attributed to genetic variation. And I don't know if that sounds a lot or a little, but I can tell you it's actually quite a lot for a behavioral trait. 25% of genetic contribution is generally considered large. And that's really good, because then you can take the next step. So we took DNA from all these dogs. And that's very simple as well. You just use a buccal swap, just like you do in, in, in the CSI or, or uh, any other police situation, right? But you do it on the dogs. So we collected DNA from about 190 of these dogs, and since we have the total gene sequence, we can use this DNA to connect specific variations in different parts of the DNA with the variations in this behavior. And what we find here is at least five strong, as we call them, candidate genes. So we have the name of five different genes that are involved in creating this variation in this particular behavior. Okay, so which genes are this? I'm not sure you're gonna be much informed from me putting up the names on the genes like this because genes have funny names and they, uh, they all come down to these funny acronyms. Don't bother too much about that. These are just acronyms for the proteins that these particular genes are coding for. Now the interesting thing is, and these are only three of the five, but the other two are basically the same story. Uh, I'm just focusing on these three here. Uh, the interesting thing is when you start looking at what are they actually doing? What's the function of these genes? Well, we don't know much about it in dogs, but luckily humans share almost all of the genes with the dogs. We have the same genes. So we can go and look in the human genome and in human genetic projects and see, okay, has anyone looked at these genes in humans and what, 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 what do they do in humans? And lo and behold, these genes are closely linked to various social behaviors and social behavior disorders in humans. So things like schizophrenia, ADHD, and autism. And if you think about it for a while, these dogs that think that they are wolves and are convinced that I'm going to solve this on my own, I'm just going to work on this thing for long enough, this is kind of an autistic-like behavior. These are the same dogs that avoid taking eye contact with humans, they avoid the physical contact with humans. So it kind of makes sense. So what does this really um, uh, mean then? Well, the behavioral genetics of dog behavior basically can teach us two very important things. We know much more about today which genes and which genetic mechanisms that people have selected during domestication. So which are the traits that humans have favored over these thousands of years of domestication? And which are the genes that are involved in this? And the second is, well, maybe these dogs can actually serve as good models for human behavior. Maybe we can understand more about our own social behavior by studying the dogs. And this goes not only for social behavior. 
One particularly interesting thing with the dog is that unlike most other domesticated animals like pigs and, and horses and, and, and cattle and so on, dogs share our family lives totally. They sleep in our beds. <laughs> they do. I can see that. I can tell that from your faces. Definitely they sleep in my bed. Um, they, they share our everyday life. They share our food to a large extent. And of course, they also then share a lot of the problems that comes with modern civilized life. So we know that a lot of the so-called modern diseases and problems that we associate with human modern life are also found in dogs. So dogs become obese, they get diabetes, they get cancer, allergies, and they get all these kinds of social behavior disorders. Really interesting thing is that different dog breeds tend to differ in how prone they are to develop each of these problems. So here we have a genetic bank of knowledge. Why is it that, for example, a Doberman is much more inclined to develop obsessive compulsive disorder type of behavior? Well, in that particular case, the gene has been found. I'm not going to give you more gene acronyms, but, but just to remind you that not only disorders and diseases, but also the normal social behavior variation, like the problem-solving trick that the dog is using, can actually teach us a lot about human behavior. So, um, when we all go home now to our dogs for the evening walk, take a look, that, look at them with some new eyes. Thank you very much.